Hey everyone, John Reed here, astronomer and author of 110 Things to See with a Telescope, A Kid's Guide to the Night Sky, and several other stargazing books. It's January of 2025 and I can tell from the comments on my videos that a lot of people got telescopes for the holidays this year, and they're eager to see cool stuff. However, I can also tell that a lot of people are having trouble, and although some are having technical issues, most have to do with expectations. So in this video, I'm going to go over 10 things that you need to understand when looking at objects through a telescope. If you take your telescope out under a clear sky full of stars, and when you look through your lowest powered eyepiece, you don't see anything, or if you see blobs that you're unable to bring into focus, those are technical issues. And there's not a whole lot I can do over YouTube to address those besides recommend that you practice using your telescope during the day or visit your local astronomy club. So let's get down to expectations. The number one thing that you need to understand is that astrophotography and stargazing are very different hobbies. This video and most of the videos on this channel for that matter are about stargazing with a telescope. The moment you try to attach a camera to the telescope, you've left the hobby of stargazing altogether. And you're probably going to run into a slew of technical challenges that are outside the scope of this video. Astrophotography with a telescope is a lot of fun, but it's incredibly challenging. Not only do you have to precisely track objects as they move across the sky, but you have to do this for long periods of time. Astrophotography is also really expensive, with a basic imaging rig starting at about $3,000. Now, if you're on a budget, there are smart telescopes like the Seastar S30, S50, or Dwarf series of telescopes, but again, this is not really stargazing, as you'll spend most of your time looking at your phone. Here's an extreme example of just how different astrophotography is from stargazing. Here's a view centered around the constellation Scorpius. This is how it might appear through binoculars in relatively dark skies. You can see the bright star Antares, and if you look close, globular cluster M4. If you really know what you're looking for, you may be able to pick up some details in the Milky Way, such as dark nebula. Now we add a camera on a star tracker with a 180 millimeter lens, and you get an image of what I think is one of the most beautiful parts of the sky. And that's just with a few minutes of exposure. The second thing you need to understand is related to point number one. You need to understand that your eyes and cameras are very different in how they resolve images in space. Your eyes have a small aperture called a pupil, and this only allows in a small amount of light. While a camera has a larger aperture and can collect light for long periods of time, effectively allowing it to see in the dark. The human eye has an exposure time of only 1 30th of a second or so and your eye only sees a very small percentage of the light spectrum, whereas most astronomy cameras have indefinite exposure times and a more broad range of light that they're capable of detecting. This is why cameras can form these amazing images of galaxies and nebula. They're simply gathering far, far more light than your eyes. Here's another example of an object through a camera, say M13, and here's the same object and how it might appear through a small telescope. It really looks like a smudge. And that's why a lot of amateur astronomers, especially those using lower aperture telescopes, refer to deep sky objects as beautiful smudges. Related to this is the concept of averted vision. When observing a beautiful smudge, one way to attempt to see more detail is to look away from the object, averting your gaze as the name suggests. This places the image of the object on a more sensitive part of your retina at the back of your eye. Here is what that might look like. Number three, you also need to be aware of how your telescope orients the image. Because there's no right side up in space, most telescope manufacturers don't make an effort to design astronomical telescopes to function like a spotting scope, one that's designed for looking at things on Earth. In fact, if your telescope simply magnifies the image and doesn't show you a mirror image or rotate the image so that it appears upside down, it's probably not designed for space in the first place. Most refractors and SCT telescopes show a mere reversed image, and most Newtonians show a rotated or upside down image. This is normal. Finder scopes also flip the image as well, which can be confusing. This is one of the main reasons I like to use unit power finders, like red dot finders, Rigel quick finders, Telrad, Celestron star pointers, or those reflex sites that seem to have recently hit the market. And then there's dynamic range. Going back to the human eye, this is one area where the eye performs much better than a camera. Dynamic range is the eye's ability to see bright and dim objects at the same time. This is particularly noticeable when looking at Jupiter. This simulated image shows how Jupiter appears to your eye. 
Notice how your eye can see both details on the planet's surface, such as the cloud belts and possibly even the Great Red Spot. And it can also see the Galilean moons at the same time. This is far better than a camera, which tends to overexpose the planet and underexpose the moons. That said, sometimes the image of the planet in your eye is too bright, and it helps to reduce the brightness either by using a filter, I found that a blue filter can improve surface details on Jupiter, or by blocking off some of the light coming into the telescope. That's why some telescopes have plugs in the lens cap. If you put the lens cap on and remove the plugs, you may get a much better image of Jupiter, Venus, or the Moon. You can also get a Moon filter, which of course can be used on Jupiter and Venus as well. Number five. Now we need to talk about resolution. In stargazing, you can think of resolution as the telescope's ability to separate two objects that are close together. We're not talking about cameras and pixel resolution here. A popular example of telescope resolution is its ability to split double stars but higher resolutions also increase the detail you're able to see on the surface of a planet. And it has a huge impact on how much detail you'll see on the surface of the moon. Although sky conditions, which we'll talk about later, also have a big effect on how much detail you can see, the resolution of your telescope is determined by its aperture. Higher apertures also grant you access to higher magnifications without compromising image quality. All right, now for tip number six, we need to talk about dark skies. When it comes to observing galaxies and nebula, the darkness of your sky is by far the biggest determinant in what you'll be able to see. That's because light from cities and towns illuminates the atmosphere in what's called a light dome. Trying to view dim objects through a bright sky is virtually impossible. While cameras can overcome this by increasing the exposure time, thus improving the signal to noise, your eyes cannot do this. Even with light pollution filters, the improvement is marginal at best. And cities aren't the only thing to blot out the stars, the moon does as well. That's why it's best to observe deep sky objects like galaxies and nebula after the moon has set or during the new moon phase when it's not in the sky at all. In the very darkest skies, such as mountaintops, those beautiful smudges start to show a whole lot more detail. Using my brother-in-law's Schmidt Newtonian on Glacier Point one year, I had no problem seeing significant detail in the spiral arms of Galaxy M101. And number seven, there's the concept of seeing and transparency. These are things we have less control of and have more to do with the weather than anything else. Transparency is basically a measure of how clear the sky is. In other words, how obstructed the stars are with clouds or haze. Last week, I was driving home in the fog and I realized when I got out of the car and looked up, I could see the stars, even though it was foggy. If I were to try to use a telescope, I'd probably have trouble seeing targets that would otherwise be visible on a clear night. An easy way to measure the transparency is to look at the Little Dipper. If you can see all seven stars, the transparency is probably fairly good. You can also rate the transparency depending on how many stars in the Little Dipper you can see. Seeing is a measure of how stable the sky is. If the seeing is poor, the resolution of the telescope is effectively reduced. This means that objects won't look nearly as good at high magnification. You can estimate the seeing by pointing your telescope at a bright star like Sirius or Vega. If the star is twinkling a lot, the seeing is poor. If the star appears as a bright pinpoint of light, the seeing is good. You can use a scale like this to rate the seeing from one to five. Note that if you're completing observing challenges for your astronomy club, it is required that you rate the seeing and transparency as part of your nightly documentation process. In the book, 110 Things to See with a Telescope, I've provided a spot to record this data on every page. Number eight, now we come to the concept of the exit pupil. Now here's a concept I really didn't grasp until doing research for a recent book on binocular stargazing. And that's the relationship between exit pupil, magnification, and contrast. In this case, contrast is how much a deep sky object pops out from the background sky when you attempt to view it. Exit pupil is the size of the light beam coming out of your eyepiece. Some deep sky objects look best when you consider the size of the exit pupil relative to the size of your eye's pupil. And you might not think you have much control over this, but you do. Exit pupil is the aperture of the telescope divided by the magnification. In other words, there is a specific magnification which maximizes the quality of the view for each object and that magnification changes depending on the size of your eye's pupil, which gets larger as your eyes adapt to the dark up to a point. Remember, you change magnification by changing your eyepiece. Magnification equals telescope focal length divided by eyepiece focal length. 
Going back to my binocular research, I was at a dark sky site and testing to see which galaxies I could see with a pair of binoculars. I'd been in the dark for hours, so my pupils must have been nice and big. I was using a pair of 10x by 20x by 50 millimeter zoom binoculars, so I could change the exapupil size while searching for these objects. I discovered that the galaxies would pop into view at around 14 times magnification, which corresponds to an exapupil of about three and a half millimeters, slightly smaller than my eye's pupil must have been at the time. This is one reason I really like quality zoom eyepieces these days. They enable me to find the magnification sweet spot while viewing the object. Anyway, the point of all this exit pupil talk is that you'll want to experiment with different magnifications to see which eyepiece or focal length, if using a zoom eyepiece, provides the sharpest views for you. Number nine, speaking of eyepieces, how do you choose the best eyepiece for the task? We did an entire video on choosing eyepieces, so I'll leave a link in the description. But in summary, regardless of your target, you want to search for it with your lowest powered eyepiece. That's generally the one with a focal length between 20 and 30 millimeters. This number is written on the side of your eyepiece. Once you've found your target, you may wish to change to a lower focal length eyepiece, which will increase the magnification. That said, most targets look best at lower magnifications. I typically zoom in only when looking at planets or the moon. So why do most targets look better at lower magnification? That goes back to the exapupil topic we discussed in the previous section. The optimal exit pupil size to maximize contrast tends to occur at lower magnifications. This is also why amateur astronomers tend to have a single favorite eyepiece that they use all the time. They found an eyepiece that's unique to them, works with their eye and their favorite targets. Also, when it comes to eyepieces, quality matters a lot. In fact, some amateur astronomers spend just as much on eyepieces as they do on their telescope. Some eyepieces that I really like at a reasonable budget are the Bader Hyperion series of eyepieces. And I recently got to test the SV Boney high-end Zoom SV230 eyepiece, which was really nice as well. And for my observatory, that may be the only eyepiece I'll ever need. I'll leave some links in the description. And number 10, for my final tip in this video, amateur astronomers sometimes need a reminder that it's okay to leave the telescope at home. Sometimes binoculars are all you need, and sometimes it's best to go stargazing without any gear at all. Some people have commented on my channel that they want a telescope to view the constellations, but you don't need a telescope to view the constellations. They're overhead every night and they're huge. All you need are cloudless skies and the less full the moon is, the better. Then there are targets that simply look better in binoculars than a telescope. This includes the Andromeda Galaxy. It looks far better in binoculars from dark skies than it does with a telescope. Then there are star clusters like the Pleiades, Hades, and the lesser known, but most beautiful of all, Alpha Perseid cluster. Be sure to check that cluster out with binoculars on the next clear night. And there are several specific cases where you should leave your telescope at home. The first is total solar eclipses. These are best experienced without any technology. Of course, use eclipse glasses for the partial phases, but for totality, you maximize your experience by taking this rare celestial event in with a group of friends and nothing else. It's way more symmetrical than uh, 2017. This applies to meteor showers as well. Leave the telescope at home and simply bring a chair and a warm blanket. That's all you need. The same applies if you simply want to see the Milky Way, which you'd be surprised how few people have actually seen. And for that, you just need a dark moonless night away from city lights. I'm John Reed. Subscribe to take your stargazing experience to the next level. Add some of my books to your Amazon wish list. And if you're a fan of the channel, consider becoming a member by hitting the join button below. And remember, the future is looking up. Sun,